we will continue with uh, the next presentation by Sherat Mark, and then we will open the session for discussion. Sherat? Dear colleagues, I'd like to thank ISD for the opportunity and the privilege to present here today. I'm going to talk about what is the uh, future of research within registries. And I really want to focus everyone's mind to two key questions that this um, talk will really cover. The first is what data should we be collecting? And the second is really how do we improve the utilization of registries to actually meaningfully impact patient care? And, and I really think this second question is something we really, as a, as a body of um, people working in the field of esophageal cancer, really have to think quite carefully about, because there's a whole plethora of registry-based research which is ongoing, but the question is how much of it is actually changing patient care? So what data should we be collecting? Currently, we collect obviously data around patients, their age, their sex, their comorbidities, around the tumor state, uh, such as clinical stage, uh, subtype of the tumor, healthy status if we're lucky, also data around neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy. We collect very, very little interoperative data, really very little around blood loss, operative time. We don't have a great idea of what's happening in the operating room. And I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more as I go on. We also collect data around pathology, such as resection margin and lymph node uh, yield, which are commonly used as surrogates for surgical quality. However, they are limited to do this. And perhaps the thing that we collect the most amount of data around is around post-operative outcomes, such as mortality, morbidity, both in the short term and in the longer term. And I'm also really um, pleased to see that some registries such as Duca and the OSCAR study are collecting quality of life um, after surgery, which I think is really important um, next step for these registries. But what are we missing? When you think about a patient's uh, treatment pathway or diagnostic pathway, there's a huge amount of radiological interventions around staging, also around surveillance after surgery. And we are, we are really not capturing any of these CT or PET CT images, which I think is something we're really missing out on when we start to think about an era whereby um, radiomics is becoming increasingly important um, and may have a future role in clinical care. Also patients have endoscopy um, at the time of diagnosis and also in some centers after neoadjuvant therapy. And again, these endoscopic videos or endoscopic photos we are not collecting routinely as part of registries, partly because we don't really know what to do with this type of data. But in actual fact, um, we're gaining a lot more um, uh, exciting um, avenues for research around endoscopic video analysis, which I think is something we're really missing a trick in if we don't collect the data. Also, there's a huge amount of research pumped into the genetics of understanding esophageal cancer and also looking at pro prognostic uh, markers, both in, in the uh, blood, but also in breath or urine, for example. And we're just simply not collecting this data. And when we start to think about factors which really influence prognosis, I would probably argue that genetics is going to be a much more important factor than many of the other factors that we're routinely collecting. So we really have to start to focus our mind as the science evolves around cancer as to what we can actually collect and how we collect it. And, and really what we focus upon in surgery is we, we focus upon mortality and morbidity. And essentially it's like after a battle, you're essentially counting the number of people who are dead and the number of people who are injured. And, and what we're trying to get from that is we're trying to get that as a marker of surgical quality. That's what we're trying to make the assumption. But I would argue that really what's happened is it's all too late. These patients have died for us to understand what's exactly happening in the operating theater. And if you look at it, you know, this, this is a really astounding statistics. 100 patients die from iatrogenic injuries each day, but approximately 40% of these occur, occur within the operating room. And really when we think about the data that we collect, we collect data around the steps of the operation. So it's like an operation manual. But I would argue surgery is more like a piece of music in so much as some people may play the music like Mozart and other people may play the music like my three-year-old son at home. They're very, very different, but they both read the music in the same way. Or you may think of it like a, a recipe, which is that people will cook a, uh, cook a cake in very different ways uh, based upon the same recipe. And in reality, that's what we're missing in surgery. We're missing understanding exactly what is happening in the operating room. There are techniques from industries such as human reliability analysis, which, which will allow us to really quantify 
uh, what is happening in the operating room if we are able to gain access to the interactive videos or interactive photos. So I borrowed the slides from my wife, but essentially this is a, um, a technique using OCRA or Observed Clinical Human Reliability Analysis. And essentially what you're able to do in an operation is you're able to break down the operation into a series of tasks and subtasks. And then you're able to break down whether or not an error occurred at each of those, um, um, at each of those tasks and subtasks. And then from that, what you're able to do is you're able to annotate the video, every step, every movement, every event, and you get from this an idea of what are the consequences of the errors that are occurring in an operation. And if you look at a surgeon, what it allows you to do is it allows you to create a fingerprint for each surgeon and looks at the number of errors per case, but also the consequences of those errors. And when you start to think about the error pathway and the data that we're collecting as part of registries, I would argue that um, what we collect at the end, which is bleeding, so you may get a transfusion requirement, it may be coded as the patient had a transfusion during the operation, but you have no idea of the errors that cause that, that, that need for transfusion. And therefore, we don't really understand how we can improve our practice to try to reduce the interruptive bleeding. But if we're able to collect the videos and analyze them using a highly sensitive technique such as OCRA, then we'll really be able to actually directly impact patient care by really understanding the steps of the operation that need to be improved. This was really nicely illustrated by a uh, video analysis of the Alicart trial, which is a colorectal trial. But essentially what they showed was, was that surgeons who performed very well when assessed by OCRA, their time to recurrence was much greater than those who performed poorer. And, and that makes logical sense that, but it's very important to be able to show it. And likewise, um, this is a very nice piece of work by Justin Dimmick in the Michigan um, Bariatric Collaborative, where they're able to look at the steps of the operation and how well they're performed they're able to look at whether or not it makes a difference to hemorrhage rates and, for example, for um, uh, anastomotic leak rates. And from this, what you can really get an idea for is in any operation, what steps of the operation are critical to determining the outcome and how well they're performed as well, which I think is something that we really have to start to think about as esophageal surgeons. Now, a lot of this work has already been developed as part of George Hanna's group at Imperial College, whereby they've, they've created uh, OCRA for Ivy Lewis esophagectomy. So, but mainly in the setting of a randomized controlled trial. But I would argue, why can we not collect the videos as part of a registry? And why can we not analyze them in such a fashion? So now to move on to my second part, which is really is how do we improve the utilization of registries to actually impact patient care? When we, stick at, when we typically think about um, study design in surgery, we talk about randomized control trials. They're very rigorous for a single variable. They eradicate uh, bias and confounders. However, they are expensive. They are time consuming. They're usually in a very highly selective group patient population and surgeon population, which reduces their generalizability of the findings. However, when we compare this to registry-based data, we often say this is real world data. So this is a large unselected patient population. It's inexpensive, uh, uh, inexpensive sorry. However, there is variable data quality and we're unable to account for confounders. What I would propose is that registry-based randomized control trials are the future of surgical oncological trials. Randomization removes confounders. They're less selective patient populations, so you have much more generalizability to your findings. Um, they are um, improved in terms of their uh, recruitment and also their follow-up compared to a traditional randomized control trial. However, you have to select a hard endpoint. The disadvantage is obviously similar to a registry-based that they are uh, reliant upon the data quality, but and they're not suitable for all types of trials. And to illustrate the point about external validity, this is the time trial, which we all know. Uh, it, there was a massive reduction in pulmonary complications associated with a minimally invasive esophagectomy. This led to the widespread uptake of minimally invasive esophagectomy in the Netherlands. However, when we published this paper in JCO and we compared the results of the time trial to the DUCA trial, to the DUCA data following the trial, what we showed was, was that there was an increase in pulmonary complications in the minimally invasive group. So this trial had no external validity when it was when the technique was adopted by the average surgeon operating on the average patient in Netherlands. And that's really important when we start to think about whether or not one technique is better than another. Is it really better or is it just the fact that you have an excellent surgeon performing the technique? And I would argue at the moment we can't tell. So registry-based randomized control trials, as you can see from the study, what they really do is they, they mix the benefits of randomization from a randomized control trial with the benefits of having a large patient study population from um, 
the core from the registry based studies. So it really gives you a, a feel for actually creating a very large patient population and confers a, a large degree of external validity to your trial findings. These are some examples of registry based randomized control trials, and I really just want to highlight the numbers of patients going through these trials. They are vast. So these trials do confer a high degree of external validity. When we look specifically at esophageal cancer, why do we need to do registry-based randomized control trials? I would argue that we have an existing network because we have several esophageal um, cancer registries nationally. We are dealing with a low incidence cancer, so these, these types of trials will increase the power of our trials. The intervention, however, must be carefully selected and a hard endpoint really needs to be used. The advantage is specifically in esophageal cancer is that it accounts for the confounders that have limited several registry-based randomized control trials, or several registry-based studies. There is less selection bias that has really limited the applicability of randomized control trials to the general esophageal cancer patient population, as I illustrated in the time trial. At that point, I'd like to stop, and I'd like to thank you for your questions, and I'm willing to take any um, questions at this point. I think Manuel's trying to get in, but yeah. uh, thank you very much, uh, Pernilla and uh, Shiraz. Both uh, very, very uh, interesting talks. Let, let me, can I start with one question for, uh, for Shiraz? Mm -hmm. so, so could you, Shiraz, because I think it's a very interesting uh, point to, to set up your registry like, uh, like that and to use it for, for trials. But what would you think, what is really uh, necessary uh, to have, or, or what, what, what do you need uh, for, for quality of data in the registry to use it? Because I can imagine not every data set is, of course, um, suitable to use. So, so how, how would you define that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Mark. I think it's a really, it's a really good point. It's, but um, I mean, it's, it goes partly to the question I asked uh, Natalie before, which is really about um, what kind of processes do you have to validate your registry? And I think one of the things that when you start to think about performing a registry-based randomized control trial, I think the endpoint has to be quite hard. So I would argue that maybe taking something like survival or mortality as a hard endpoint, which is collected routinely within registries, is an important, um, uh, important starting point, really, because you have to start somewhere. And then I think the second thing to think about is carefully is your intervention and the timing of your intervention around when your data is put, in, put into your registry. So, for example, in the UK, um, a lot of our data is put in after the surgery, may, in some cases, maybe several months afterwards. So it may be that we have to start to think about performing a retro-based randomized control trial in the adjuvant setting um, and something that may come after surgery. For example, a trial on rehabilitation and looking at survival after, after surgery and rehabilitation, there's no reason why that trial couldn't happen within the context of a registry. Yeah, there is more question. I have uh, uh, one question to Pernila. Is uh, um, uh, 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 how would you? Um, uh, there are now uh, uh, two or three re registries that uh, has been shown are uh, are collecting data on on, on prompts. Uh, um, uh, we are using mostly. Uh, um, uh, um, the the questionnaires, the ERTC questionnaires. Uh, um, uh, uh, what would you recommend for other uh, outcomes? Well, I think that uh, a questionnaire like the ERTCs and and the fact uh, includes uh, a good basis for information yeah. uh, to start with. And of okay. course, if you if you would like to evaluate fatigue or that, that that's um, uh, another question of, of including maybe a specific questionnaire for a specific aspect but otherwise I think that these two uh, covers uh, a lot. Okay uh, there is a question from Bill, Bill Alun. Thanks Manuel, it's, a, it's really a comment to share us 
uh, actually comment on this. When we set up Eureka, it was very much understanding what different countries did. And there was a mixture of audits, as in the UK and Holland. There were registries, uh, which you developed um, subsequently in, in, in Spain, Manuel. And there were groups of interested collaborative surgeons and their teams that work very closely together. I think what you're proposing is entirely appropriate because it's where you get the bigger numbers in there. But it, it's, it's how you can address, and it's part of what Mark said, but it's how you can address to make sure everybody's going to record the same sort of data and in the same level of accuracy with, with a validation content to it. Because that could, and if there, there are smallish differences, that could confound that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Aaron. Completely, I completely agree with you that um, the limitation of these types of trials will be the data quality, like with any registry or, or any kind of audit. It's absolutely down to uh, down to that. The question, I mean, I guess the, the the point to make is is that potentially by trying to say that we are going to do trials using these registries, that by default we'll end up improving the quality of the entry of the data anyway, and I think one point to make really clear is, is that it's not it's not um, not every registry is is, uh, is amenable to performing a trial in almost certainly not, but I think it's I think we are missing a trick because I think we have you know created incredible data sets now for many years. Um, these are vast numbers of patients that are going through, and I think we have to move away from um, trials which are involving just you know a small number of centres and trying to make that. Uh, trying to make the argument that that's externally valid because I, I don't think it really is necessarily all the case all the time anyway. So you mean real life, real life? <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. And I think I think the trials from uh, from the uh, you know our anaesthetic colleagues, our trials from our cardiology colleagues, really imply that I understand it's a completely less complex intervention. Sorry, apologies to anyone, um, but, but fundamentally it is. But that we're talking about, but 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 essentially their principle is is what they're trying to do is they're trying to reproduce what the effect size will look like in real life. And I think, you know, whether or not we absolutely agree with the study design, their result is the most likely to represent what we see in clinical life um, compared to a artificial, a potential artificial experiment um, in a high volume center performing a randomized control trial. I have another question also for uh, Pernilla. And um, so it's also always a big interest also of me what, what what would be the best way to use the prompts because I, th I saw there was also a question on it in the Q&A because you'll get uh, you'll probably get uh, patients uh, answering and patients not answering and there will probably be a difference in those two and uh, what I liked in the, the we didn't do a lot of research with it but if, if you if you have uh, in your uh, in your outpatient clinic and you have your patient and they fill in something and you can focus on the questions they have it really um, it in increases the uh, efficiency and also the intensity of your visit with the patient and the questions you get so i'm, I'm not completely con convinced it should be anonymous i, I think there's like something that it should be back and forth between surgeon and patient, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. What, what do you think about those two points? I mean, I think it's the most important is to, to collect the data. So, so, and I believe that doing that in the clinics is, is an advantage because you have the patients there and, and you can collect it. And you can also at the same time use it together with the patients to you know, follow a trajectory or an intervention or so. And at the same time, you can register the responses into a registry. So if you do that for all patients, then you have collected the data in the same way for everybody. So I think it's a matter of, of doing, I mean, either you do it centrally, like in Sweden, where we have someone sending it out and it's done like that for all patients, uh, or you do it in the clinics and then you collect that in that way for all patients, you do it in the clinic. So, so I think, um, um, how it works best is what you should go, go with.
I don't know if you have a comment, Shiraz, in, about patient collecting patient reported outcomes. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I mean, we, we, I mean, quite a few of us did the laser study together. I think mm -hmm. Mark, uh, Manuel, we all did the, we did the laser study together, and I think it was. Um, the aim of that study was slightly different. Um, I know, um, obviously, the URCC are very well validated questionnaires, but I would argue they are primarily in a research setting. Mm -hmm. So the laser study was really intended to try to develop a tool which we could use in clinical practice, mm -hmm. which could identify patients with a poor quality of life, and mm -hmm. then interview them. And that was really what we were trying to do with that study. So mm -hmm. um, I think there's always a balance. I mean, people talk about questionnaire fatigue, Penilla, as well, and you can probably speak mm -hmm. to this than I can, but. I, you know, patients do get tired of filling out long, mm. long questionnaires. Um, mm. And I think um, there's a balance to be had between getting meaningful information that we um, that we can use to analyze, to um, identify uh, whether an intervention is effective or not, and overburdening patients and getting meaningless data at the end of it. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. With the development of, of technical, uh, you know, devices and and mobile apps and and things like that, there is also a possibility to to have patient reported outcome data collection in in that uh, way where you if you don't have pain you you don't have to answer five questions about pain or or so so you, that tool could generate the best questions for each individual I think in the future. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Mark, we even ask something or can I ask? Yeah, I have a, I have a question for Pamela. We, uh, we collect PROMs in Ontario for all cancer patients when, historically when they came into the cancer center, obviously with COVID uh, that has stopped to a large extent and we are starting to move patients online. So when you move patients, when you've moved patients online, how are you getting that information back to the care team so that they can intervene upon it? Um, because it, then it be, just becomes a, a data collection tool for a report at the end of the year and not a point of care intervention. Yeah, I think that uh, having, it, having it connected to the, the medical records, for example, could be one way of, of getting the data into the, the care system. Uh, and, and of course, if, if, if in some way where you, if you collect it electronically, you can also like log in to that system as a as a healthcare professional to to look at the patient's reporting and and you know track to over time and so on. So I think it's it has to be made available in some way. Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, maybe uh, one question. Maybe I mean I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of people here, are obviously running their own registries. But um, um, have I mean apart from Oscar and uh, in Sweden, has anyone else um, integrated? Uh, and Natalie spoke about it. But in um, what are the challenges really around integrating proms into a registry at a national level in a high volume country like the Netherlands, Catalonia, England? Maybe even Nick, if you want to speak to it, I guess. I, I, so, so we've talked quite a lot about this in Novka. We're very keen to do so, but this, what we've struggled for years now on resourcing the data collection in, in the institutions. And I'm sure other people would experience that. And we haven't, I mean, I've spoken to Bill a lot about this over the years, but it's a real problem in some institutions. As you know, in Oxford, we, we have soft money from university funding to, get, to collect all our data. If we started trying to collect all the problems as well, well, we couldn't collect all the problems, I'm afraid. My view, and this again is, this is something we've suggested to NHS England, that, that this sort of data collection has to be linked to the commissioning process. So the trust will only, the industry will only get paid for the, for the, for the case if they can demonstrate they're adequately resourcing data collection. And then if we can do that, then we would love to collect information on problems. Yeah, in Holland, we're also um, col collecting those now and they're, 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 they're um, sent out uh, through DUCA, of course, but it's, it's still difficult to get um, high percentages of responses by patients uh, per institution. So we, we made it um, 
um, as, as one of the items that, that is shown uh, transparently, so to insurers and patients, if you collect prompts, but we, we're still not able to, to put a number like a 60 or 70 percent participation on that because the participation is still pretty low. I think um, we, we, we should look at ourselves as healthcare professionals to, to, to try and increase that, but it's still that is still one of the difficult points um, here in Holland. In Ontario, we collect PROMs in the cancer system uh, and it's strongly encouraged um, if it's not mandatory. So the variation between the cancer centers is somewhere between 30 and 80% PROMs collection for the patients coming through pre-COVID. Uh, Post-COVID, it's much worse. Uh, for the orthopedic surgeons, the government mandated collection of Nottingham uh, hip and knee before and then six months afterwards and it's part of the funding bundle. So the data collections high 90s um, because you don't get paid as, as an institution if your data elements are missing. Um, so they're using the data very differently than the cancer centers are because the cancer centers are using it as point of care when you sit down and, and see the patient and then secondarily as uh, reporting of what's going on across the system in terms of symptoms. Uh, but the way the government has structured the orthopedic system, um, it's always collected because they don't get paid if it's not. So it's just a matter of the setting of the priorities. I can just comment on, on this. The pre-register for the NREV in Sweden, uh, it was also, uh, they, they said you have to have patient report outcome in, in your registry to get the funding. So it was quite early on, it was introduced in, in the national um, quality register in Sweden. And, and after it, it uh, went to the, the one with the soft gel and gastric together, it, it was very easy to continue to incorporate that in in the system, I think. Um, what do you say, Jan? Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. But, but our coverage rate for, for PROMs and PREMs are quite low. Mm. And maybe this is due to the fact that we include any patients who have developed this or gastric cancer. And mm. it's not all, always surgeons or oncologists who, who see those patients. It's mm. uh, other kind of doctors, and that's why it's different, difficult to to increase coverage rates. Mm. It's okay. Uh, thank you, Jan. I'm Pernilla. So, Mark, I think uh, uh, I think we've had a very stimulating, a uh, very interesting uh, uh, session on a, I think in a very important uh, uh, topic, and and uh, this is an area that. Uh, 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 currently is very important. Uh, we need to have accurate uh, data from our patients in order to better improve them. So uh, Mark, if, if you want to, uh, to close the session. Yeah, thank you, Manuel. And uh, I, I would really like to thank all the, the panelists who took so much time and effort to uh, prepare and uh, hold their, their presentations. It was really, really nice to see all different uh, views from different countries, different continents. And I, I hope our participants had a, had a good time uh, in um, being present here and, uh, and listening to all of you. Um, I think most of the, the, the questions were answered. So if not, then we will still share them with you through, uh, through ISDE. And on, on behalf of, uh, of Manuel and me and ISD, we would like to thank you very much again for, for all your help in making this a great, uh, um, a great session. Uh, I just heard from Leah that she says, don't uh, put your camera off because we are going to be in a very nice group photo, uh, which we can tweet around the world uh, after this session. Uh, anyway, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, and I really hope we can um, uh, end this Zooming and start seeing each other live again. <laughs>